Hi, everyone. It is wonderful to welcome you again to a new Alpha Female Workshop. I'm Michaela Yon of Sony's Alpha Universe, and I am excited to be back with the Alpha Female family here. We have an amazing guest with us today. Uh, for those of you new to the program, as you know, uh, Alpha Female has been around for about three years, and we are in the Alpha Female Plus era now, um, where we provide a grant, we award a grant every month uh, between now and the end of March. Uh, for a deserving photographer with an amazing project. Uh, we provide a grant, we provide the gear uh, and the platform to uh, make your work known to the world. So uh, as part of that, we want to bring you, and as part of our amazing community, we want to bring you these interesting and exciting events as we go. And today is no different. We have with us internationally known photographer, author, speaker, uh, she is a multi-hyphenate. She has done some amazing things and has told some amazing stories uh, that we've all benefited from. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome with us today none other than Sony Artisan of Imagery, Nancy Borowick. Welcome, Nancy. Thanks for having me. So, so happy to be here. To have you. I, I miss seeing you. This whole, I was, I I was watching the video earlier and I realized that that entire video, everyone in that video shot everything during quarantine. And I was just amazed because I know that we're going to look at it back in, in like a few years and be like, can you imagine we did that while in quarantine? So how has your life been in the past year? You know, I, all things considered, I've been really lucky. Uh, it's just been mostly trying to navigate work and having a toddler, um, <laughs> which is, which has all been very exciting and fun and exhausting and overwhelming. So I, I dream of the day when we could all be back together in person again. Same, same. Uh, I think 2022 is a year. I'm holding out hope. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So uh, that's that's perfect because I think a lot of people are uh, feeling the way you are and they can relate. And uh, yet creativity has not gone anywhere. A photography um, has been booming. And one of the places where people have been photographing a lot has been their own backyard. So I can't wait to uh, hear more about storytelling in your own backyard. And I'm going to let you take it from here and walk us through all the cool stories that you have for us today and all the awesome lessons. Okay. Looking forward to it. Okay. So, uh, as Michaela mentioned, I'm Nancy Borwick and I'm a documentary photographer living in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Today, I'm excited to talk with you about how to be a storyteller and capture authentic family moments uh, during this holiday season. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, my road to becoming a professional photographer. And as I wrote in the workshop description, get personal with you. Storytelling has always been a part of the fabric of who I am. I've always been a bit curious, maybe a bit nosy. And I have it on good authority that as a child, I was a bit of a tattletale. I like to think of it as an early storyteller. <laughs> Fast forward through college and beyond, photography became my primary tool through which I could explore stories around me. So I decided to enroll in the International Center of Photography to hone my skills. I was willing to do almost anything to make this path a reality, including telling a little white lie here and there. We all know that it can be a challenge to get face time with the industry's editor, excuse me, editors and gatekeepers so when the chair across from me, or sorry, not across from me, across from the features photo editor at Newsday, which is one of our regional newspapers, um, sat empty at a portfolio review, I jumped at the chance. 10 minutes in with 10 minutes to go, we were gabbing like old friends. And uh, she said to me, you know, I like you. 
and I like your work. Do you have a car? And I said, of course I did. And that seemed to seal the deal. Uh, I knew that opportunities were hard to come by, especially for a newbie like me. So I couldn't possibly give her a reason not to hire me. And I figured I could find a way to get a car. This opportunity kicked off my career in the newspaper world. And while each of us has had to shoot things that we weren't super excited about, like sweaty people on the hottest day of summer, I discovered that attitude makes a huge difference. I consider it a critical tool in my tool belt. I got the call to drive out to suburban Long Island to photograph a popular chicken Parmigiana dish. I knew that this was my chance to show this editor what I was made of. So what did I do? I shot the crap out of it. I shot it from every angle using window light, flash, fork, no fork, wide, tight, you name it. My commitment to this chicken parm paid off because when my editor saw the images, she was blown away and probably a little surprised by how much I worked the scene. And she kept calling. We all know that one of the major keys to developing intimacy and empathy in our work is through time spent with our subjects. And that's not always easy to come by. Assignment work for newspapers rarely offers much time for deep storytelling. So I had to learn how to connect quickly. One morning, I got a call about an assignment where I needed to photograph a man recently released from prison after 20 years. I walked into the room and he barely made eye contact with me. I snapped a few photographs and realized how awful they were. So I put my camera down. We needed to find common ground. I had just turned 29 and it turns out he had two daughters, the loves of his life, who had also just turned 29. The shoot began to turn around and we left the stuffy office space where we had been instructed to meet and hit the street. Then, just as I was beginning to define my path, something big happened in my world, in my backyard. And things started to unravel. Photography became my lifeline, my way to make sense of it all. But first, let me give you some context. The year was 1979. The place, Long Island, New York. <laughs> The hair was big, the sideburns long, the sleeves puffy, and the dance moves electric. It was Labor Day weekend, and my parents were tying the knot. They met at St. John's Law School in the musical review. They, uh, my mother sang, my father danced, and they continued this dance for 34 years. By early December, 2012, my mom was deep into chemotherapy treatment after a second recurrence with metastatic breast cancer. When my dad got his diagnosis, stage four pancreatic cancer, there they were in treatment together side by side. And this was our new normal. I couldn't heal my parents. So I did what I knew how to do. I photographed them. I wanted to spend time with them, not knowing how much time we had left. And what I realized pretty quickly was that the story that I was documenting and the story that we were living wasn't about cancer and dying or dying. It was about living. It was about life. 
I believe that when you are faced with your own mortality, you truly begin to appreciate what it means to be alive. We spent our time doing things we enjoyed, like eating calorie dense meals because dad needed to gain back some of the 40 pounds that he lost. We stayed up late drinking hot chocolate, dancing around the kitchen, and reminiscing about our lives together. And of course, there were also big moments that we could all look forward to and be totally present for, like my wedding. The reality, however, was that we were really existing together on borrowed time and Two weeks after my wedding, my father's, my father took a turn for the worst. <sighs> it became clear that his quality of life had sharply diminished. And with tumors encasing practically every organ of his body, he had had enough. It was his life and his decision to make to stop treatment and to sign the DNR and we had to honor and respect it. But I look at this image and if you take away all of the wires and the machines, he could be at the beach without a care in the world. He had time to think about his death. Both of his parents had died when he was just a child. So he never expected to live as long as he did. My dad died on December 7th, 2013. It was the 40th anniversary of his mother's death and exactly a year and a day since diagnosis. He would have loved his funeral. There he was, center of attention, surrounded by all of the people he adored in the world. When I asked him if he was curious about what people might say about him at his funeral, you know what he told me? He said, I don't wonder, I wrote it. And then he handed me his eulogy, which was 14 pages long. <laughs> but, life had to con but life had to move on. And so the story continued. My mother was the opposite of my father and hated to be the center of attention. I think she found purpose in the distraction that the distraction from her disease that caring for my father gave her. Having been sick on and off for 18 years, cancer was just another item on her to-do list. She was the queen of to-do lists and I get that from her. And to me, her list screamed life. Order Howie's headstone. Decide regarding radiation one exclamation point join the gym and start going four exclamation point and my all-time favorite what happened to the girl scout cookies all of equal importance and all on a note <sighs> there is really only so much a person can take and by the following fall my mom's health started to deteriorate. One night while lying in bed beside her, she asked me to look into options for home hospice care. And I said, of course, as I slowly turned my head to the other side of the pillow so she wouldn't see me starting to cry. Somehow I couldn't believe that we were at this point. She had been sick for so much of my life. I thought she would be sick forever, but still be here with us, which is so unfair. I began to obsessively record everything in this time in images, in videos, in phone recordings of conversations I don't even remember us having. I needed to hold on to her as long as I could, as much as I could.
it was hard to find levity in these final days of my mom's life. But lucky for us, we had Moses, a friend's dog, who would sit on top of my mother's chest and snort with every breath. My mom watched my dad die in the hospital with machines beeping, fluorescent lights flaring, and a slew of doctors and nurses who were practically strangers. She didn't want that. She wanted to be home in her pajamas, listening to James Taylor and surrounded by her family. So that's what we did. And as we watched her chest rise and fall, we all locked eyes in a sort of, you okay? You okay? And then she stopped breathing. December 6th, 2014. 364 days after my father passed away, we were back at the temple. Only this time, the seat next to my brother was empty. Not too long after she died, my siblings and I decided to start the daunting task of packing up our family home. And to my surprise, it was actually a really beautiful experience. We uncovered greeting cards our parents wrote to one another, shoe boxes full of four by sixes, even teeth collected by the tooth fairy. What do you keep? What really matters in the end? This was a challenge for me as I am a bit of a collector, but I think that just something my mother shared with me before she died. She said, the people you loved, they live on inside of you because they are already a part of the person that you are. I am my mother's daughter and I get to keep that forever. In Jewish tradition, you return to the cemetery a year after the death to honor the person that you lost. We call it an unveiling. Because of the timing of my father's death, we decided to hold off on, or sorry, we, because of the timing of my mother's death, we decided to hold off on my father's unveiling and honor them together side by side when we were ready. Life determined the end of the photographic part of this project, but I wasn't done telling the story. So I set about a task of rounding out my images with actual bits and pieces of their lives together and their lives before one another. It was highly therapeutic for me, especially because it enabled me to celebrate their lives and not just properly mark their death. I wanted to memorialize my parents' story in some way to give it the gravitas and the lasting legacy that I felt it deserved and to share it with the world because I figured that if diving into the full lives of my parents as I documented their death helped me process my grief, it might just help someone else. So I decided to create a book that could contain all of the wonder and joy and love they shared to the very end. You can imagine my total shock, however, when I had the opportunity to share my idea with a representative from a big book publisher. Oh no. Okay, um, you can hear me. Okay. Okay, that was strange. Um, ah, the internet. <laughs> um, wait, spoiler, you just saw what I was gonna say. Well, anyway, you can imagine my total shock when I had the opportunity to meet with a book publisher um, who after hearing my spiel, uh, looked coldly <laughs> 
into my eyes and my soul and said that no one wants to buy a book about death. It took everything in my power not to burst into tears in that moment. He had so clearly missed the point. Fortunately, you can, um, sorry. Fortunately, the great thing is when someone tells you no, it's actually licensed to do um, your, do it your way on your terms. After two days of wallowing and thinking about giving up, I realized that I didn't really need him or any publisher to make this dream a reality. So I decided to launch a Kickstarter campaign and crowdfund the project myself. And guess what? He was wrong. <laughs> People did want the book. People did want to have the hard conversations. And by the end of the campaign, I had raised over $65,000 from 740 people who believed in what this book could be. But the photographer and me needed to be shooting. I needed to exercise that muscle. So when my editor reached out um, three months later and asked if I wanted to shoot the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show, I couldn't possibly say no. And I am not exaggerating when I say that this assignment brought me back to life. And I'm going to pause here because we are now ready for the next section. And spoiler alert, it involves dogs. <laughs> My favorite topic, dogs. I cannot wait. Me too. <laughs> um, this, the story always gets me. It, it is not the first time I've heard your story because I know your story, but it always, it always really gets me. And you're such a good storyteller. Um, so thank you for sharing that with the rest of the world and for sharing that again. Appreciate it. Thank you for allowing me to share it. It's, I, I feel lucky that I can, I remember my parents so vividly and the lessons that they taught us. And I think that comes from being able to share it. Um, and I, I'm just grateful for that. I think a lot of people are, um, want to tackle this topic of, of grief and, you know, life and death and the intersection of it and and they're not sure how to and I think you provide some really great lessons for for that in in your book so highly recommend that people um, check that out um, I do want to let people know that because we're alive they can ask you questions directly you are here to <laughs> answer their questions so please submit your questions there either under the question mark on alphauniverse.com if you're watching there or if you're watching on YouTube live in the comments and we'll pick them up and we'll make sure that um, Nancy tells us uh, more of what you want to know. So um, let's go into the next section because I just really, really want to hear about the dog stories. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. Oh. Nancy's easy and fun guide to visually approaching the holidays. So shooting in your own backyard may seem simple or feel a bit boring on the surface, but it's actually more, challenge more challenging than you would realize. Yes, you have access. Yes, uh, you have some control. But now you have to use these things to create something new and unique in a place that is probably anything but, and with people you are probably very familiar with. You know, how do you see your life and your family through a new lens? I think this is what makes the holidays a perfect place to experiment visually. But to get there, you need to just start creating. I think the best stories involve some strategic planning, but then also picking up your camera and firing off some frames because stories will unfold and reveal themselves. You just have to be patient. I think 
I believe that the first step is storyboarding. Every story has a beginning, middle, climax, and end. I, I like to think about it like an essay or a song and look at how the narrative starts and finishes. Um, this is also really helpful after you've done some shooting, you know, to really see some of the holes where that you're missing. Um, <laughs> deconstruct the taco. Mm -hmm. Something I've recently came up with. <laughs> what do you need to show to tell a whole story? I mean, is it even a taco if you don't have the shell? And are you the shell? So think about all of the pieces that come together to make that top what you want it to be. Look for the vignettes, look for the little sub stories. You know, um, my family story, I, I said that it started, I thought it was about cancer, but it actually was about so much more. So when you think about the holidays, maybe you peel back the layers of that onion and you think, well, what is this really about? I believe that there are six elements to a strong story. Sense of place, action moment, strong character development, meaningful detail, empathy, and the climax and the end. Forgive me, um, as I will be using images as examples that speak to these ideas, but they are not from the holidays. Full disclosure, the last few holiday seasons, I've been navigating new motherhood and I didn't challenge myself uh, the way that I'm challenging you today, but this year will be different. This year I am gonna go in there with a plan and my gear. <laughs> so I have an ongoing project that explores the relationship between dogs and the people who breed, own, and show them. I spend days at a time embedding myself into the homes and lives of these people and their dogs trying to understand their motivations and why they choose this life and this pack to be their family. Okay, sense of place. There are many ways to show sense of place. You wanna answer the question, where are we? And give the viewer some context through a kind of establishing shot. Maybe over the holidays, that is a wide shot of, of the exterior of the home, or it's an interior that speaks to home. Maybe it's like a wall of family photographs. Okay, action moment, action moments, action slash moments <laughs> often speak for themselves and reveal themselves in different types of ways. Frankly, with eight grown dogs, in this home, there were many action. There was always action and um, many opportunities to document the chaos. Maybe over these holidays, um, it'll be the kids covered in cookie dough batter that they're preparing for Santa. Or maybe it's um, that moment when your nephews come running in through the door to get that long awaited hug from their favorite aunt. When it comes to character development, I like to think, you know, who is this story about? Who should we care about? Maybe it's focusing on grandma, the matriarch of the family or spreading out wider and spending some, you know, intentional time and focus with each individual person or dog. Anyone who knows me knows I am a lover of a good detail shot. In this project, there were way too many fun details to document, so I shot them all. Uh, that way, later on, I could go through my photographs and spend time with them to really pick out which ones I felt were the most relevant and meaningful to the story. I think details over the holiday can be so many, there's just so many fun things to, to photograph over the holidays when it comes to details, so shoot them all. 
and really make each one count. The decorations, the lights, the outfits, the cookies, the candles, the recipes, maybe even style that photo of the pumpkin pie by grabbing a small flash or video light or desk lamp. Seriously, I've done that. Um, and just have fun. Developing empathy in a story requires that you as the storyteller are invested in your subject because if you don't care about them, why would a viewer? I think it's about digging deep, connecting, and not being afraid to be vulnerable. And then there is the climax. It all leads to this moment in the story. And we need a way to get there um, for us to find some kind of resolution and closure. A big event helps, but it also could just be the end of the day. Once you feel like you've gotten all of these and done them well, then shoot all the other stuff, fill in the gap, and ask yourself, what is missing? How could I do this better? Or how could I do this in a different way? Should I come back later when the light is different? You know, push yourself. Create your dream shot list. I like to go into every shoot, even if it's tiny, with one. It gives me some direction and some structure to work within. What do you think about when you think about the holidays? Food, recipes, twinkling lights, family and friends, tradition and memory, winter time, the fireplace. <laughs> For me, it's lots of hot chocolate, spinning the dreidel, my Christmas aloe plant, and lounging in my pajamas for four days straight. <laughs> Sketch out the frames. If you have a vision in your mind of a photograph you wanna take, draw it out. I find that that actually helps me as a reference when I kind of get sucked into everything and, and distracted. Um, and find inspiration. I have a mood board actually on my phone because I always have my phone with me and it, it, I just wanna have it accessible. But I have a mood board actually in Instagram where I save pictures that, you know, show me an interesting technique or style that I want to try. You know, have that in your hand, in your pocket, at the ready, so you can experiment. Hold oh, these. <laughs> Sorry. Let go and have fun. <laughs> have your camera with you. Be ready to react, but also anticipate. And use what you've got. Like I said, the desk lamp or my favorite source of light, the window. Break the rules, you know, play with your camera. It has so many interesting features and you just, you know, sometimes it's really hard to break the rules, but sometimes that's how you get most creative. Shoot things out of focus, work with blur and motion like, just don't stop yourself before you get going. And this is the hardest, but try to be less literal. I struggle with this, but maybe if you let your feelings guide you. For me, the holidays are all about nostalgia. So, and that's, you know, like that's the feeling I want to capture. So think about that. Think about how you can shoot less literally and photograph what you're feeling. And maybe that's just being aware of your surroundings and be paying attention to when something happens and you're like, oh yeah, like I do feel that way. <laughs> um, and yeah, okay. So that's actually the end of our second section. There's a lot of, there you are. A lot of stuff that a lot of, uh, a lot of things to practice. I want to, I want to focus on one which I think is an issue for a lot of people, and okay. that is vulnerability. You you mentioned that. So obviously the story that you've been telling and a lot of the stories that, that you've focused on over the years um, have been very vulnerable stories. How do you get into that mindset and how do you cultivate that ability as a photographer 
to feel vulnerable and then also to learn how to capture other people's vulnerability. So I've, I didn't know to, I didn't know I was doing this um, when I was starting out, but um, out of, kind of like as an anxious habit, uh, when people, when I could tell people weren't necessarily comfortable with me photographing them, my instinct was to sort of like, be silly and um and reveal things about myself you know like really disarm them um and and sometimes it does take a lot of conversation before people will really open up uh, i think actually the hardest people to get to open up are your family members um and i think part of it is being really open about what you're trying to do uh maybe sharing in the collaborative process with them um and just kind of laying your cards out. I I find that whenever I can share something personal or, um, yeah, whenever I can share something personal with someone I'm photographing, it really, it makes it, it becomes less about the photographs and what I'm doing there and more about the human connection. So I always like to have my camera with me so they don't forget that I'm a photographer and that I'm there to take pictures. But um, that also the other struggle with family is that you know they're so aware of you it's not like you can blend in and, and observe all the time um so that's where i think you just need to work on your reflexes and just like being ready and sometimes that's also taking a, if you're going to go take a photograph of your family and all of a sudden everyone looks at you and smiles you know you take that photograph but then you wait a little longer and wait for people to like relax and be off their guard and maybe someone pokes someone else and things unravel. Just it's so much about, I think also observing and just waiting around, if that makes sense. It, it does make sense. Um, it's waiting around is probably the one thing that um, most people just, uh, <laughs> you know, decide not to do, which is to their detriment or to the detriment of the, of the art, but uh, cultivating patience as a, uh, as a photographer, it seems like uh, kind of a must. Um, yeah, so, I so. <laughs> a couple of more questions for you. You you shared with us a list of things that we want to do. What is the one thing that you are mindful of not doing uh, when you are shooting photography, especially with family? Oh, that's interesting. Um, well. So my background is in photojournalism. So I my instinct is never to pose or to ask someone to do something again. Um, and I feel like once you draw attention to you as the photographer, that changes the dynamic. It's one thing if they see you with the camera, it's another if you're like, okay, everyone, I'm here, but don't pay attention to me. But like, I have my camera in front of my face. Um, I don't know. I guess there's a part, there's also a part of me that feels like, um, I try not to also, I feel like I'm contradicting myself, but like, yes, you love being that observational fly on the wall. But at the same time, when you're photographing family, you're part of the family, you know, like you're, you're in it. And, and that means, you know, feeling out, feeling out, you know, the scene and, and, um, I don't know. I that's a really good question. I have to think about that because now I maybe I'm just not as self aware as I should be. No, um. no. I'm, I mean, I think you. <laughs> I, I think I think you nailed it. It's a difficult one, right? But um, yeah, the posing that, that makes a lot of sense, or the not posing for that matter. Uh, do you have a favorite lens to uh, to do uh, family photography? I mean, I do. Uh, it's the thirty five one. I am. Uh, I'm a prime snob and I've gotten very used to, you know, I yeah, having a toddler has really, you know, forced me to make hard decisions like what camera and what lens am I going to keep near me? Because I have to keep an eye on it because one, I have a toddler who all he wants to do is touch it. Two, I have a toddler who all he wants to do is drop it on the ground. Um, <laughs> and, and so if I had to choose, I pick one. It's my 35 one four. It's, 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 I just think it's the most versatile lens. Um, 
that you can use uh, and it allows you to get wide. It allows you to get tight. You just have to move your feet. <laughs> you want to zoom, you move your feet. So. Okay, well noted, prime snob, no zooms here. Uh, understood. <laughs> um, cool, well, uh, again, reminded everyone, you can ask your questions. Um, I think we have a couple more I'm gonna save for later. Let's go to the okay. next section and then we'll come back. Okay. All right. Executing the plan and making beautiful images. Please hold. Okay. So what makes a good photo? <laughs> In my opinion, a good photo will have most or all of these considerations. Light, point of view, intentional depth of field, framing, action, thoughtful composition, originality, pattern, visual, visual symmetry, patience, and you. Light. Photographs can't exist without light. So what and where are your light sources? I am a huge fan of ambient light and window light, especially this time of year. Candlelight is magic. And of course the golden hour in the morning and in the evening, you know, there's so much light to find. And if you can't find it, make it. Point of view, get creative. Maybe this year, uh, my visual story of Hanukkah will be told from the perspective of my son or maybe for Christmas, I'll shoot it from the perspective of the unwrapped present in the closet as it makes its way um, under the tree, wrapped in the, then into the hands of my son. I don't know, why not? Like, get high, get low, go inside, go outside, really move around. I think that's really important. Depth of field. Playing with depth of field can be a very powerful tool because what you choose can dictate how the image is perceived and understood. I tend to lean on that soft depth of field, that 1.4, uh, which isolates one object, you know, or person, forcing you to focus on, on what I want you to focus on. Um, or you go wide and you go for a large, or not wide, you go for a, a large depth of field, um, which could be a really nice way of showing the glorious chaos of kids running around and opening their presents or, you know, just it. be intentional, think about it. And of course it's a, it's a personal choice, what you decide to go with. Framing. This is really important because you are deciding what to include versus what not to what not to include. Um, for me, this was shooting wide. This was most likely shot with my 35 millimeter that I spoke about. Um, I wanted all of the information. I actually looked at this image recently and thought, well, what if I had shot it really tight? Uh, and it was just kind of tightly framed on the dog. And while it might have been beautiful, it would have been missing so much context. I I often try to see if I can tell a whole story in one image. Action or inaction. See it happening and wait, have patience. Like I said before, so much of what we do is observation and waiting for these moments. You know, I saw this cat and I was like, oh, like this is only a matter of time, it's gonna happen. And it did. Composition, be strategic and pay attention to your edges. Be persistent and keep shooting till you're happy with the image. Don't settle. You know, remember that very first image I showed of my parents in the chemo chairs? I actually shot that same image on three different occasions until I felt like I got the frame I wanted. Originality, get creative, experiment, think outside the box or 
from inside the cage. <laughs> How can you do it better, differently? Pattern, visual symmetry. This is my favorite. Strong images tend to come from those that have layers. I saw this picture. I saw the, the painting of the dog hanging on the wall. And, and so I waited for one of the dogs to come into my frame. Actually, it happened a bunch of times, but the light wasn't right. So I just sat there and I waited until I got the shot. Patience. <laughs> Patience, patience, patience. Kids and dogs in particular can be quite predictable and they will repeat their behaviors. So that gives you plenty of chances to get the shot you want. So anticipate and have your camera ready. And you, this is your backyard and you are the storyteller. No one can tell this story the way that you can. So you have to trust your gut, trust your instincts, and just shoot. Some of your photographs will be intentional. Some will be happy accidents, but only if you take them. I believe there is no way to shoot objectively because all of your life experiences will color your work. And that's a really beautiful thing. So get out of your own way, lean in, and tell your story. Back to you, Michaela. Lost in, in the photos, I was trying to just put myself in the middle of it. it. It all tells a story. Is this your goal every time to tell the story with one photo? You know, it has become that because I think it comes from my background in newspaper photography where often they only give you one photo in the paper. Um, it was sort of like before digital where now you can have like a bunch, but uh, you often only got one. So how can you tell the whole story in one image? And sometimes it's sort of waiting for that, that one image to unfold. Um, but I think especially around the holidays that can Again, I think it's about patience. It's about observing. It's about going in there and and look now look at your home in a new way. Picture the frame, you know, like where are people going to be? Where is the nice light? Let's just let's control what we can control and then wait for something to happen. Like that's kind of the way that I think and work. And the more you think like that, the less you have to think about it. Um, but I really try, like. And usually I don't know if I've gotten the whole story in one image until I look at, I look back after the fact, you know, like I look at that, that first image of my parents in the chemo chairs. And, um, when I look at that now, I think, okay, yeah. Like that image does to me represent the whole story. If I had picked one, you know, it spoke to their cancer, it spoke to their relationship and how together, but also it spoke to the relationship that they both had with their experiences dealing with this cancer. Um, I just, there were, there were all these layers that I could unpack. I just had to sort of spend time picking it apart and figuring out, figuring that out. Well, I think it's, you know, obviously you've had this, the benefit of, um, honing your photojournalism craft and knowing when to get the shot and how to get it and, and just boiling it down to the one photo. There are a lot of opportunities yeah. these days for photographers to kind of like, post their their story out there whether it's on Instagram or whether it's on platforms like Medium or Substack or you know places like this what is um a question we got is what is the right amount of photos to tell a story um where it's not too few but it's also not too many to bore the audience so is there a sweet spot or does it really just depend on what we're talking about um, okay. So when I made my book, I was like, this story needs to be told in 200 images. <laughs> um, but the reality is like, there's so, I feel like we see so much content and so much information and the, the, the school of thought when I was a student was less is more. Um, but you don't want to have too few that you're not 
you know, giving the story justice. I think one of the first things I learned in school was you're only as strong as your weakest image. So that's when you lose people's attention. So you don't want to include images just to fill in space. And if you have to fill in that space, maybe you go back and you shoot it again because, or, you know, you want to be able to stand behind each image. Um, but, uh, you know, it's so tricky. Like on my website, I think most of my projects that I show there, I probably include about no more than, no more than 20 images, which in, for some people is too many. Uh, but I don't care. I think it's a, if I think it's a good story and I think all 20 of those images need to be in it. So be it. I think it's important to go through your images and something I see um, a lot in my students. Um, and it's kind of hard to see this as the photographer, but as someone outside looking at your work, um, one way to really call down your, your edit and your fine, your final edit is, are there any images in there that kind of tell the same story? You know, are they from like very close in time? Like, and, and they just kind of look similar. Um, are they, you know, thematically, are they, is it repetitive in a way that takes away from the story? So I always recommend that people, you know, share their photographs with other photographers who understand that and understand storytelling. I also show it to non-photographers um, to get that kind of objective perspective. Um, I don't know. I think 20 is the sweet spot. Uh, but you when, I first published, <laughs> when, I, when I first published the story on my parents, I was told, okay, you will have six images in print, which is a lot, uh, and 12 online. So how do you tell this story um, in, in six images and 12 images? And someone once told me, you know, you just have to kill your darling. That was like the, the phrase. Yes. Like you, you might love an image, but maybe it's not your strongest. And maybe they're it's taking away from the the bigger story, um, and that kind of have to take a step away and be like, okay, I have to tear that bandaid off and make decisions. I think I actually got pretty good at that because when you shoot news, you have to edit quickly. You have to you have to narrow it down so fast, and so it was like I couldn't dwell on the images. I just had to make hard decisions based on my knowledge as a photographer. That uh, that makes a lot of sense. The kill your darlings phrase is something that writers um, take very seriously as well. And you've combined the two quite well um, over the years, the writing, uh, storytelling with writing, storytelling with photography. Was that something that came to you naturally or did you um, learn it as you went? Um, how, how did you combine those two to make it effective? I mean, I got in, I think I fell in love with photography because it was a way that I could communicate and be creative because I did not have those writing skills and still feel deeply insecure about my writing skills. So this is so nice that you brought this up. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think I actually got much better about writing uh, with my writing um, when I started to actually submit my work to contests because it forces you to write about your work. And even though I, you know, I submitted my work to contest and didn't win, it was the, it, it forced me to go through the experience and, and start the process. And, you know, I would share, I would share what I wrote with other people to get feedback. Um, and the more I did it, the better I think I've gotten. Um, but it's, not still not great. I, it's a struggle, but it also at the end of the day, when you want to share your work um, or publish your work, especially if it's personal, you often get asked to write the piece. And frankly, when it's personal, you kind of should write the the text that goes with it because no one knows the story better than you do. Um, and that that's like an extra layer and level of of intimacy and vulnerability and. Um, it allows you to maybe even talk about things that don't come through in your photographs, but are important to the story. Well, we are our harshest critics, so I'm sure oh, that yeah. you are, you are a bigger critic of yourself than, uh, than we are because we know your work. 
Um, and it's particularly relevant to the discussion for our audience because they need to write an essay um, in their application for Alpha Female Plus. Um, yeah. And that's something that a lot of people bring up. They say, I'm a photographer. I'm not a words person. I don't know what to say. And it's, well, it's a good skill to have. And um, doing it over and over will actually get you better and better over time. And you're going to be able to sell the story more effectively. So um, yeah, sure. I, I'm glad that. I'm glad that you felt a struggle because a lot of people do. And um, there you go. It's possible to overcome it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I still struggle, but I'm in a better place with it. Good, good. I'm glad. Uh, another question that came in was related to lighting. You love to shoot a lot with available light, uh, which is wonderful. Do you ever carry um, a light with you? Do you ever have any kind of light that you use in various situations? Oh, um, so for years, no, because I was feel I felt really insecure about my um, abilities with flash, and I, I would just you know I didn't, and you know the gear, like I live for my A one now, and like the capacity in low light is like who needs extra light, right? Um, <laughs> but that's just me talking myself out of it. Um, I. Uh, I do have a light now. Um, it's a Stella Pro light that I, it's little, so I, I pack it around with me, but I never end up using it. I mean, I, I do on occasion, but like rarely, I feel, I just get awkward about it. That said, um, I, I'll tell you a quick story that when I was once photographing this retired actor, I, I met him at a classroom where he teaches and it was the ugliest classroom with the worst fluorescent light. And I was like, okay, this is my nightmare. Like, how do I deal with this situation? And I actually almost showed that picture today. Um, and so I brought my light with me and I set it up and, and I was like, okay, I had known nothing about lighting, but like, let's just turn this on. And I turned off the fluorescent overhead lights and suddenly he looked like an actor on stage, you know, like the little, this tiny little light lit him up and it was beautiful. You know, it was like one of those moments where I like gave myself a pat on the back being like, all right, like I just had to be, you know, like resilient and resourceful um, and trust my instincts. It could have gone terribly, but like it wasn't that bad. So, I mean, I even have a little like video light that's like this big that I sometimes carry with me just in case. But um, I need to get I need to get better at it. I need to just stop being stubborn because I think light can be really powerful and beautiful and you don't always get that perfect light. And um, I, I mean, but that's something I'm working. It, go, it goes, it goes back to your previous lesson, which is experiment, like try it out. Don't, don't yes. be shy about trying. I mean, what's and the worst I did, that can happen, I literally, right? I exactly. That's what is the worst that can happen, especially with digital photography. You can see it right away. You can delete it. Don't delete it in camera. Wait until you're on your computer. But like, um, but I also, I have used my desk lamp to light pies. Yeah. You don't need like a fancy light. Like you can just, you use, and it's amazing because you look at like these food photographs in magazines and you're like, wow, they must've had a big studio. No, no. I used to shoot food for the New York times and I had a video light that was this big that I carried around and would just hold it while I would shoot. And I'm like, okay, this works. You would never know it. Well, never. You, I don't, I don't you think. mentioned the alpha one earlier, like, especially with the technology now, like don't assume that it's oh, yeah. necessarily big like, studios. Right. Oh yeah. No, that's, I mean, honestly, I think I've told you this a thousand times. So, like, that was why I, like, moved over to Sony when I did because <laughs> the low capabilities and the dynamic range wooed me. Like, yeah. And my back thanks, thanks you for it. So, you know. But, you know, it's, I'm, I'm obsessed with the camera. I'm obsessed with all of my cameras. Um, this, is, <clears throat> this is my newest one. So, I'm obsessed with it. Uh, but, aren't yeah. we all? We're all obsessed with it. Yeah. It's it's yeah. the right thing to be obsessed with <laughs> in our world. Um, so final question for you today. Um, if you were to leave um, someone who's aspiring to become a published, established storyteller with a piece of advice, what would that be? Oh, man. Um, I 
I'm stealing this with, uh, I'm stealing this from um, Kirsten, uh, Kirsten Lewis. Uh, it's always a no unless you try. You know, you want to shoot something, but you're just really not sure. Just do it. And when it comes to storytelling and when it comes to sharing personal stories, I think there's great value, great value in in that because I think those stories go deeper and um, and you, what you bring to the table is really significant. So don't, you know, don't write that off. Your personal story and your personal connection to the story, I think, is just as important to the story as anything else. Um, and with that note, too, if you are going to publish it or you share it, do your best to not take it too personally if, if maybe you're not getting a reaction or a response because... Um, not like, you know, that publisher, not everyone gets it. And that's okay. Honestly, that was, you know, that was fuel for me. I was like, I'm going to prove him wrong. I'm going to prove to him that people care about this kind of a story. And you just have to, like I said, trust your gut, trust your instinct, um, rely on your community, lean on your community. Oh my gosh. Like I, that's a, such an important piece of advice that I would share. Um, your community is is going to be there to support you and critique you and help. So, and oh, good footwear. Please wear good <laughs> footwear. I spent too many years wearing my like really amazing Converse and now I have like some serious back issues. So. Well, that's that's a good that's a lot of great advice and, and use rejection to fuel you. That's such an important one um because ultimately it will happen for you. Uh, that yeah. you've shared some amazing lessons today, Nancy. Thank you so much. Um, it, it was wonderful as always and uh, a pleasure. And I'm sure that we will see you again in the future with uh, some more amazing stories. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. And um, yeah, I've got, I'm cooking a few more stories right now. So stay tuned. All right. Okay. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, you can follow Nancy uh, on Instagram, on Facebook, on her website. Um, so please do that. Uh, she's wonderful, as you could see, and she has some amazing stories to tell. Um, and uh, for Alpha Female, you know the drill. You can follow Alpha Female on Instagram. Use hashtag Sony Alpha Female to share your work so that we can take notice of it and maybe feature you. We have the most amazing group of people on Facebook, Sony Alpha Female on Facebook. Join the group. Join the group because, as Nancy said earlier, the community is so important and uh, you will get a lot of support, a lot of advice, a lot of ideas. So uh, just take one minute now and, and do it. You won't regret it. And, of course, you can get all the details about the program at alphauniverse.com slash alphafemale. The application is there and a reminder that you can apply every month with a project. So submit your first project now. The deadline is December 5th and uh, you won't regret it. And uh, speaking of dates, as I mentioned, December 5th, that's the next grant application due date. Plenty of time to get it all in order, record that personal video, make it all happen. We also have a photo contest every month that happens on Instagram. Uh, the entry for that is due on the 12th of December. So go take a look at our account, um, see what the theme is and uh, enter uh, because there's a lot of really cool photography that's shared um, every month there. And uh, you might win a nice little camera uh, to go with that. And then um, we're gonna have another big event on December 5th, Sunday, December 5th, Creative Space live online. Uh, we're going to have a lot of great speakers, um, live shoots, giveaways, uh, some interactive experiences. Um, it's all coming to you on December 5th. So uh, please uh, register and uh, put it on your calendar so that you can be there with us because it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and that's it for us today. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for attending our workshops, for being part of the community. Um, you are the reason we do this, and we really appreciate you. So until next time, take care, uh, and have a wonderful holiday season. Mm -hmm.